everybody. Thank you for jumping on. Again, I know this is a very crazy time, but we are excited to have Bruce Dell, our head compounding pharmacist at Roadrunner for us today. He's hilarious, so you're in for a treat. He does have a background of 40 years of experience with 26 of that being as a military pharmacist. Uh, I'll just turn it over to Bruce and he can tell you more about him and get going. And then we'll save questions. You can either um, put that in the Q&A and then Heidi and I will work through those at the very end. So I'll turn it over to you, Bruce. Thank you. Good day. Bit of a sound check here. Are you doing okay? Yes, sounds great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for indeed uh, joining us. I, I know your challenges just became exponential and and yet some things still need to march on and, and uh, this field will continue to show its resilience and its unbelievable tenacity in, in the face of adversity. I am Bruce Dell. I am, as uh, Christy said, a senior pharmacist. You can read that any way you want, mature, wise, or uh, ancient. Uh, in case you wonder about the OBG, uh, I self-identify as an old, bald guy. So we're going to talk about some uh, issues. We talk about specialty pharmacy a lot lately, but it's essentially compounding. And we'll talk about where, where that fits into a typical practice and, uh, frankly, uh, what you should be looking for in a provider of that type of care. Next slide, please. Well, you know this way better than I. You have some outrageous owner challenges that uh, continue to plague you at every hour of every day, and certainly even more now. Uh, but uh, these folks often come to you with uh, pages of internet printout or uh, pictures and, and notations from a blog, and they know exactly what they want. Uh, they've read about it. They've had a chance to interact with their colleagues um, on the blog and, and understand all the nuances. And, and uh, likely even at the back of 100 sheets of internet printout, there's a a script that's already printed and if you'll just sign uh, I'll be on my way. Uh, how you do this is amazing. Just when I think I've I've had uh, a wild experience with a 40-minute cat lady call, uh, I think about your life and uh, I can't begin to imagine. Next slide please. We also have a lot of pet challenges in your world. Uh, we as a society ask you to manage every species but humans. And we ask you to be experts, and we ask you to be efficient at it, and we ask you to be all-knowing. Wow, unbelievable uh, the challenges that we, we put on you. And, and of course, no one wants to compensate you for this incredible level of skill, and that's, that's another session. Uh, but what you must face in the course of a day is astounding. Um, people tend to think that your days are pretty regimented, uh, and that just couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, it may start that way at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and then things just fall to hell. Uh, room 10 has uh, a, a, a car accident waiting for you. Uh, room 6 has uh, uncontrolled diarrhea, it, it, it just goes from there. And then there are the phone calls and everything else. Um, it's, it's astounding, the pressures that you face. Next slide. Still, uh, it, it's been my experience that uh, very few uh, practitioners uh, have the level of wit and humor that you all have, and it's a real pleasure to, to work with this incredible team. Um, I thought taking care of America's heroes uh, after 26 years was the best gig I would ever know. And uh, this last decade working with you has given me more professional challenge, uh, more opportunity for uh, professional growth than I ever thought possible, certainly at this age. Next slide. So let's kind of start with the definition. A compounded medication is a unique custom-made product that fills a prescription written by you uh, when there is no commercially available alternative. At no time is compounding ever meant to replace a commercially available product. And in fact, many states are going to uh, a, a level of scrutiny that's, that's asking you to defend your reason to use a compound. And that makes actually pretty great sense in some regards. It, it asks that challenge of us internally to justify why we're deviating from uh, indicated, commercially available, well-tested products. If you can justify that, 
then you're absolutely cleared hot to, to, to proceed. And we'll show you some of those justifications. You might be sitting back now and thinking, well, that, I, that seems like a tough definition. You'd be surprised at the, at the justifications that, that can drive you into a compounding area. Well, that said, uh, if, if you embrace compounding, and I hope that after uh, the 600 slides that we have coming, you, you will, uh, you'll recognize that uh, we can, as, a, as an industry, offer a compounded version of a proprietary medication that differs in strength, dosage form, flavor, for example. Uh, we can, with that, then offer you and your pet owners a much more exact dose in terms of uh, milligram per kilogram than what's available proprietarily. Big Pharma just isn't meeting all of your needs. Uh, you know way better than I that that uh, 25 milligram tablet just isn't gonna be sixth or eighth uh, appropriately by the owner to get what you need to do. And um, we'll see some other opportunities here to, to prevail with some of the therapeutic challenges that you have. Next slide. So a survey was commissioned maybe five or six years ago now. And in that there were simply uh, two questions. And the first question, the more relevant was, uh, is compounding part of your world? And 40% of you at that time responded that yeah, I probably use a compound maybe every week. 30% of you said that you prescribe compounds every day. Well, I, I would submit that uh, that number is higher, significantly higher. Why? Let's look at that. Why? Next slide. Well, uh, this is an outrageous indicator of the status of the supply chain at, at, at any given time. Uh, while this is from uh, two summers ago, uh, it hasn't changed appreciably. Uh, this is a list published by the FDA. It comes out every week. And uh, this one is actually um, uh, from two summers ago that shows the sad, sad state of drug availability. And that's the backwater of the, the shorted products. Uh, this absolutely affects every single clinic and therefore many, many of your pets uh, and uh, pet owners. It's, it's crazy. And we're, we're not talking about mint flavored vitamin C wafers here. We are talking about really, really substantial things. Uh, and from here, you can see that even at this time, we, we were actually out of sterile water and sterile saline. Uh, next slide. This is a huge range of drugs, and, and they are far from insignificant. These are antibacterials, chemotherapeutic products, a lot of cardiovascular uh, issues associated with uh, back orders. I mean, we need to look no further than pimobendin, for example, to see the impact that that had. Some uh, CNS agents, and then, of course, uh, a, a lot of electrolytes and nutritional uh, products are uh, unavailable uh, periodically through this. It's never been worse than it has been in the last five years. I think we are seeing a little improvement, uh, but uh, certainly the, the economy drives this. Profitability drives this. Uh, remember that there, frankly, are very few drugs that are unique to the vet space. Uh, the vast majority of drugs have a human indication and, oh, by the way, can be used in the vet space. Uh, and uh, the prices you've seen when, when and if they're gone and then come back, uh, is almost always higher. And of course, what drives that is really third-party reimbursement on the human side. So it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, touchy balance, if you can even call it a balance, and uh, it, it's incredibly impactful to your day-to-day -day practice. Next slide. Where do they go? Uh, I've heard from a lot of different practitioners. Are they the result of Aliens? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. And in fact, if you see the uh, circle chart on the bottom, 51% uh, when you call them, when you ask for clarity on the disposition of these, they can't tell you why the product is back ordered. Is it indeed a raw material issue? Or are we suggesting that the atropine tree has been over harvested and that's why we're out of injectable atropine? Hard to say. Uh, I think a great indicator is to be able to call a guy like me and say, can you do it? And I say, yes. Uh, well, clearly, uh, we, we don't have a raw material issue. Although, to be perfectly uh, honest, uh, big manufacturers need train cars full of raw material. And uh, guys like me 
need just kilograms. Uh, but, but not that long ago, uh, the major manufacturer for amidocide was unable to provide uh, malarsamine for heartworm uh, patients. And that product was completely shorted uh, except for some allocations from certain programs. We were able to source this product in Belgium, the properly tested, bring it back, and uh, we estimate that we probably saved the lives of about 3,000 dogs. So we tend to look at raw material shortage, uh, but th there are caveats to that. Also, certainly supply and demand, as we're in the middle of a toilet paper crisis right now. Uh, yeah, totally understand where this, this balance goes. Uh, sometimes natural disasters, as we've seen from some of the hurricanes and uh, natural disasters like earthquakes play, play heavily into this, and that periodic. Next slide. Why else would you use a compound? Well, I would suggest that uh, innovative therapeutics are a huge contributor to the drive towards specialty pharmacy. So secnetazole, imagine, is a single dose therapeutic used by you all for uh, Giardia, particularly in shelter site. What a great opportunity to embrace compounding for that. Oxantil is coupled with things like praziquantil and pyrantil to give outrageously great kill rates for tapes, round, whips, and hooks, and, and even residual rates up to three weeks. Uh, compounding was using fluorophenicol long before it became a player in any commercial product. Nidazoxanide, uh, increasing frequency, as you know, uh, and uh, as I know this to be kicked around in some commercial circles uh, for animals, and particularly animal strengths, uh, is available only through compounding. We look at Ociltamivir as uh, Tamiflu, and uh, we may even be seeing some indications of that here uh, as, as this disease plays out. But there has been an enormous following in the vet community for the use of Ociltamivir in Parvo. If this is uh, diagnosed early and this drug gets on board, uh, many practitioners are able to actually uh, avoid hospitalization uh, with, with oseltamivir. Tinidazole is an old, old human drug, 50 years old, and, and another great alternative for uh, the use in, uh, in Giardia. And ranitazole, I know of no commercial product that meets your needs for tritrichomonas except ranitazole as a compounded product. So these and so many more are great innovative therapeutics that, that you can embrace, uh, but available only sourced through compound. Next slide. Why else compounding? Well, uh, this is a list of ingredients in a single amitriptyline 10 milligram tablet. It's amitriptyline 10 milligrams per tablet and all of the rest of these things. These are excipients and excipients are used in big pharma settings to enhance the flow of powder through tubing and to compact and to uh, and facilitate coatings and things like that. My guess is that you want active ingredient and not much more than that. Um, and the point being is that some of these have actually been attributed to sensitization in animals with atopic conditions. Uh, so uh, many of these are just not extensively tested in our population. Uh, so, for example, uh, I, I know Christy probably has a corporate credit card, and she will buy you a lunch if you can tell her the safe level of titanium dioxide in cats. We just don't know. And, and further, to, to be able to test these to, to your level of satisfaction for their sensitization potential, we simply don't know. You can avoid all of these sort of things and more by controlling the contents uh, through compounding pharmacy. Next slide. Well, the perfect indicator for compounding pharmacy is to enhance compliance, facilitate dosing. Uh, our little buddy here clearly has a little bit of a behavioral problem here. And, and, and you run into this every hour of every day. And, and that is we either have a pet who doesn't want to be dosed and or we don't have an owner uh, who's uh, dosing savvy, and we, we need help. Sometimes you need transdermals, sometimes we need titratable liquids, sometimes we need really, really small tablets, sometimes we need doses that aren't sixth out of a big tablet that, that you can facilitate dosing. The point is, dosing is often adversarial in our population, and sometimes we need some help. And whether it be tricking or facilitating dosing, uh, compounding pharmacy can take you there. 
Next slide, please. And, and if you embrace compounding pharmacy, wow, there are, there are lots of different alternatives here. Now, uh, uh, melts are a big deal. Uh, rapid dissolving tablets are huge in, in our world. Um, rapid dissolving tablets that, that completely dissolve in, in the presence of animal spit uh, in, in five or 10 seconds. What, what a great opportunity. And often they're soft enough where they, they can actually be crunched and put over food instead of a, a, a large tablet. Uh, easy press tablets are easy to split, and then that not only brings uh, facilitated dosing to the owner, but that allows you to get a larger tablet and then conceivably split that, and, and that really enhances the value because the really rarely is it the, the amount of drug in the tablet that influences the price. It's the labor and the shipping and everything else. So you can get a five milligram cisapride tablet for the same price, frankly, is a 10 milligram cisapride tablet. Split the dose, half the price. Uh, liquids are an unbelievable way to titrate uh, medications and get the steady state. Uh, a number of your colleagues use uh, trilostane suspensions, for example, to, to get to where they want to be. And then if that steady state equates into an easy to dose capsule, well then bravo. But if it does not, then it's often an opportunity for you to continue to use a liquid for steady state and owners are not stranded with a bunch of solid dosage forms that they can't use. Uh, great opportunity. Capsules, of course, not terribly flexible, but uh, they offer much better dating, just like tablets. And uh, oftentimes, as I mentioned before, are a great source of value. Uh, flavored chewables to enhance the dosing process. Wow, what a great deal. Uh, oftentimes the base, of the chewable is actually part of an animal treat. Uh, so imagine things like pounce and uh, bacon strips and things like that. We take these and we grind them into a fine powder and then we incorporate active ingredient and then we re-plate uh, these into a, a tablet or a chew or, or, or some type of a, an easy to dose uh, dosage form. You've embraced it a lot of different injectables as a result of compounding pharmacy and primarily because many of these have gone away. You don't have a great source for apomorphine. Uh, only through compounding can you obtain that. And uh, many folks use this as an ocular solution. Some folks use it as a rapid dissolved tablet, but what a great opportunity to embrace this as an injectable. A great dosing format that's accurate and prompt. And many of the antidotes that you're used to, uh, succimer, um, things like that are, are, are just not available on, on a regular basis or frankly have fallen off the table because there's no human uh, opportunity for it. Transdermals, while there is a little controversy over um, efficacy, uh, those things that do work, work surprisingly well. And a great opportunity then to embrace a transdermal dosage form and uh, facilitate that. There's a question mark here about a dosage form. Uh, it, and uh, in uh, a, a, a live environment, we, we can uh, ask for your thoughts on what's the next big thing. But since we can't see a show of hands and have any fun with that, the next thing that we're seeing a great deal of is the incorporation of active ingredients into suppository formats. Um, because I think we all can agree that it's easier to dose the non-biting end of a cat than it is the biting end of a cat. Now, while there are very few studies, uh, to support this, um, th there's, there is experience in the use of this dosage form with other things, um, midazolam, for example, maybe diazepam, those kind of things. And um, oftentimes um, the lack of positive isn't always negative. Sometimes you just have to try things. And so uh, the point is, is that you, you have alternatives here if you need it. Next slide. Oftentimes facilitating the dosing process is really no more complex than just flavoring. Uh, it's been our experience that uh, the bitter flavor of many drugs, particularly parasiticals, is best masked with a sweeter flavor. It's not uncommon for you to call me, tell me that you'd like to do a prescription for ranitazole. We discuss flavor and you say, well, he likes chicken. Well, he's certainly not going to like chicken in ranitazole. Uh, may I suggest vanilla butternut, maybe marshmallow, and you might very well think, what adult? This is a cat, come on. But you'd be very surprised that 
these very sweet flavors mask the bitter flavor that's associated with these things and facilitates the dosing process that way. You and I both know there's a, 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 a list of uh, drugs that just don't get really good. Uh, the talisans of the world, the clindamycins of the world, even Pred, they just never get come running good. Best we can offer is, is uh, less worse. Uh, still, uh, flavoring does enhance that process as well. Consider too that many of these animals have um, conditions that uh, are, are caused by allergens or maybe you have to concern yourself with a caloric source. So please ask your farm pharmacist about that. We're dealing with a cat here, uh, or we have a dog who's on a food trial. We need to avoid these things. I, I need your recommendations. Same thing with calorie source. Next slide. So, uh, indeed, why compounding? Well, here they are. Commercial sources don't always meet your needs to include dosage forms and strengths of those dosage forms. These unique dosage forms that we talked about, the uh, the titratable liquids and, and transdermals and suppositories and chews are not always available through big pharma and uh, you, yet you often need to embrace them to, to facilitate this dosing process. A lot of stuff is gone. Uh, you and I have grown up with Centrine, for example. Uh, it went away when Port Raj was uh, acquired. Um, still, through no fault of anyone's, no side effects, no adverse effects, Centrine is gone. Uh, so many of these things have simply disappeared because there's either no market, there's no human involvement associated with the product, um, profitability waned as a result of an acquisition, whatever. Th these products, great products, have gone away. The opportunity to utilize innovative therapeutics, as we mentioned, is a really great reason to justify a compound. And the opportunity then to avoid potential sensitizers, equally impactful as you look to justify the use of the compound. Consider too that some of your patients have uh, multiple drugs on board, uh, particularly as they age. We, it's not uncommon for us to see a little enalapril, maybe a little spironolactone, maybe a little pinobendin, uh, whatever, but some of these drugs can be combined. You can imagine putting two or more APIs into a single compound and dosing less frequently. We can go from six to eight doses of drug throughout the day to maybe two. And, and what a great opportunity to enhance this process. Next slide, please. Well, this question always comes up uh, in a big discussion and that is, what about efficacy studies? So this whole thing with the suppository, for example, anything to show efficacy? No, rarely is there. Uh, most of this stuff is anecdotal at best. It's you telling me that it worked well in this particular animal and then me having that information when another provider calls. So uh, much of this is just anecdotal, not unlike, frankly, 2,000 years of ancient Chinese medicine. Just not really great studies out there. Many of the studies had variables. Uh, clearly, studies take a lot of funding. We just don't seem to have a lot of that. And then there's little consistency. The studies that we get, uh, the, the, they come from the vet schools uh, are often really small ends, uh, just not a long period of time. And often, um, well, there's a phenomena that, uh, that occurs. It's, uh, oh, I know, it's called graduate, graduation. A and the, the, uh, the people who are doing the study uh, graduate and, and the study's concluded. So we just don't see a, a lot of concrete studies. If you're looking for evidence-based information, it's, it's just not there. Uh, very few things offer that, uh, and uh, it's almost exclusively experiential. Next slide, please. And studies are impactful. I get that. Here's a perfect one. Uh, enjoy, enjoy this. I, I find it remarkable that they put their name on it, frankly. Um, so I, I, I often question studies, and, and, and so should you, and, and uh, we need to look at the credibility of the, the study and the studier. And, and the final conclusion, uh, which almost always is the need for more studies. Next slide, please. As you look to a compounder to meet your needs, there are a number of things that certainly you should be seeking. And, and of course, the first is quality. Uh, I think we can all accept the fact that the sentinel indicator of quality right now, at least in compounding pharmacy, is PCAB certification. This is the Pharmacy Compounding Accreditation Board. It's a hugely 
arduous uh, uh, inspection. It's a survey that often involves uh, more than a thousand key points or indicators. It's a two to three week uh, process. It's very, very expensive. Uh, and uh, the uh, annual um, reassessment is equally as, as arduous. So, so PCAB uh, is a huge uh, indicator of quality wherever you go. Be, look, be looking for that. Equally impactful is the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. This came to be when boards of pharmacy throughout the nation needed to assess the quality of an out-of-state pharmacy, but couldn't afford to send a team to that pharmacy. So these guys all got together and decided uh, on indicators, and then they would um, uh, have a central team come out. Those results then would be published for all of these national associations, and, and that's how some of the state licenses are determined to be uh, um, uh, issuable. So for example, Rhode Island can't send a, a team out to, to Phoenix to look at my shop. So, so they rely on the NABP survey that uh, the single group did. And it, this is becoming increasingly popular. It is a, a very, very uh, t tenuous uh, inspection. And uh, the survey is often called the tagament moment in my world and often not just a moment. It's uh, long and uh, very, very complex. Uh, also recognize that while not specific, because this has been pushed down to the state level, the FDA still very much has a role in compounding pharmacy. Uh, and then of course, as I mentioned, the state boards. No state board is the same as another. They all have things that they're looking for that are unique. And uh, your board certainly is unique over all the others. And we'll talk about some of those issues as well. Wow. Uh, but we have to toe the line to the standards of 50 different states. Not an easy task. Next slide, please. You were talking, uh, we're talking about justifying the need for a compound. Sometimes just a picture makes all the difference in the world. And uh, Christy can help you with this. There's a 10% discount if you order this uh, while you're meeting, just place the order over your uh, audio. And uh, this is a perfect reason uh, to use a compound. Great, great opportunity to see relatively immediate results. Next slide, please. Maybe you have one of these animals uh, and their charges on the side. Uh, great, uh, great opportunity to uh, know when your dog is charged. Some of the challenges that we face, well, uh, regulation certainly. Uh, and, and your state is, uh, is not new <laughs> to, uh, to the complexities of this. Uh, they're a very engaged group and, and uh, all of them are, frankly. And, we're, we're trying to look at national recommendations, and we'll see this in just a little while. National recommendations, how this is applied to each of the states, drawing the line between human pharmacy and vet pharmacy, very, very complex. Um, I, I, I can't begin to tell you how many times a regulation has been proposed. And when I called the State Board of Pharmacy and said, well, how in the world are veterinarians supposed to apply this to their practice? The answer is, frankly, we didn't think about the veterinary uh, mission it, when we proposed this regulation. We were all spun up over the ramifications of the human side. And, and I get that because our state boards of pharmacy are typically challenged with, with pre preservation and protection of humans, true enough. But um, I increasingly, many of these regulations uh, or um, recommendations have a ramification in in your world, and uh, it's it's really crucial to empower your your VMAs. This seems to be a great place to start for these opportunities to to make an impact with the VMAs. We work closely with many of them and uh, guide them through the process to make sure they understand the uh, the the full uh, extent of where we're going with this. And wow, what a great opportunity to get in front. And, and your state has been <laughs> remarkably proactive in this with some of the stuff that's uh, been promulgated by the, uh, the folks there. Uh, formulary consistency. The, I, I, would, I would gauge that most of you think that the, that the formulation for Cisapride at my place is the same as it is across the nation. And, and you really couldn't be further from the truth. There is no consistency in formulation. 
um, barely get consistency in the assignment of beyond just dating, frankly. Uh, what Bob does down the street is all different than the guy that uh, is doing mail order from uh, some other state. Uh, we're, we're all different. Uh, and, and so this involves, I think, a fair amount of transparency. As you look for a provider for compounding services, it's crucial that you ask that provider for some transparency. Uh, I know that's a little bit of a time-consuming thing, and it may only involve just your initial encounter with these guys. Uh, when you decide to choose a compounder, let's look to quality. What have you got? Uh, are you PCAP certified? Are you certified by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy? Um, what's the training level of your typical technician? Those sort of things. And while that is a little bit of work in the beginning, it gives you that level of assurance that everything downstream uh, then is made by a quality organization. Um, formulary consistency is crucial uh, it, to include studies. Uh, so how did you determine the, B, the BUD, the beyond use dating? Did that just come to you in a dream or were you able to submit this for some type of uh, stability indicating study to, to give you the assurance. Crucial that you have that information. And as I said, it is a little bit of time up front to, to make that determination, but it's imperative because there is virtually no standardization in this business. The USP guidelines are, are often a, a great way to, to bring compounders into the fold. The USP, as you know, the United States Pharmacopeia is a group of uh, experts. Uh, they, they get together periodically every three, four, five years, and based on new technology, new thoughts, uh, new procedures, they then formulate guidelines for guys like us to compound medication. Some really, really big things going on. You'll see a slide in a while here about uh, USP 100, but uh, key to uh, changes that are happening and challenges that we'll all face are contained in their chapter 797, which is the chapter that guides us on how to make sterols. So as it is, for example, if nothing changes, USP 797 will uh, say that no sterile product that's compounded will be able to exceed 45 days dating. Wow, that's pretty monumental. And, and recognize that, that this is in the absence of any type of study or data to support otherwise. I may very well have stability indicating data that supports 180 days worth of, of potency for that sterile product, but this will not be entertained. Well, not surprisingly, this is being contested, and rightly so. Um, I think we, we need to, to look to those people that can provide that kind of data. If, if I have spent $30,000 on a stability indicating survey that shows that kind of uh, maintained potency, that ought to be relevant. Uh, and, and yet what we're considering in 797, uh, it, it isn't even accounted for. So uh, they met, they got together, recognized that uh, that is something that should be considered and, and, uh, and they've gone back to the table. Uh, so their deadline has come and gone with, without uh, putting this out publicly, but uh, it, it's going to be a huge impact. That means that the triple antibiotic eye ointment that I make for you in lieu of the shorted product, 45 days. Um, wow, that's, that's crazy. The antibiotics uh, that, that uh, you have that are still uh, parental products, apomorphine injection that you hopefully never use, uh, would expire every 45 days. That's, that's really crazy. So we're waiting to see where that comes. We're also seeing some changes with 795 for non-sterile products. We'll talk about 800 in just a minute. So tons and tons of challenges um, face you and I every day. Uh, your, your constant quest to get back ordered, innovative products uh, are often altered by some of these challenges. Next slide, please. Well, here it is. Uh, you likely know that uh, December um, of last year was when USP 800 went uh, public. And USP 800 is basically a guideline that was put forth by the, the uh, committee to protect the health and well-being of healthcare workers who handle hazardous drugs. So 
that begs the question, well, what really is considered hazardous drugs? Well, there are examples on the bottom of the slide. So we tend to think of anti-neoplastics and that rightly so, but also there are others that uh, are, have fallen into this. Uh, Sodofavir, eye drops, for example, uh, cyclosporin, um, not surprisingly, DES and estrogens, uh, but methimazole, for example, is classified as hazardous material in this, um, in this issuance. Uh, things like colchicine, fluconazole, um, griseofulvin. Uh, so what are the ramifications to you? Well, wow, actually a lot. That means that it requires special storage conditions, handling, uh, labeling, certain training for both the people that work in your uh, pharmacies, in your clinics, and, and us, uh, and then even uh, clinicians who administer. Next slide. Go ahead, Nikki. So this is sort of a, a summary slide, but let's take a look at uh, the third category down. If you're using tablets and you're cutting them or crushing them to make up a suspension in your clinic environment, then you'll need double chemotherapeutic gloves. You'll need protective gowns. Uh, you'll also have to have some type of uh, respiratory protection if this isn't done in a protective hood. So this kind of gives you a sense of the, the, the level of protection that's being uh, recommended primarily uh, uh, for, for these different categories. So an anti-neoplastic might have more stringent requirements than say uh, colchicine. The fact is though that uh, this is being applied across the industry and, and, and virtually every practice is, is being uh, touched by this in one way or another. It's not just the full blown chemotherapeutics that we've often associated with this. It's, uh, it's down to other levels that uh, sometimes you're a little surprising. Next slide, please. So uh, not everybody's making the journey to do this in my world. Uh, to do hazardous material compounding is remarkably expensive. Uh, we've put more than a uh, million dollars into our hazardous material rooms that, that will compound colchicine into a suspension for you, for example. If you're looking for a titratable uh, suspension for fluconazole, um, you just don't get that anywhere. Not everybody has the, the engineering uh, controls, the environmental uh, protection that uh, uh, is, is mandated by these statutes. So uh, we're talking about designated space and environmental monitoring. This also insists that we have, uh, and rightly so, master formulations. Uh, and then uh, also, um, extensive data to include uh, the determination of BUDs. So uh, a lot of stuff going on here and not everybody's making a journey. Uh, it's increasingly hard to find a local guy who's, local guy or gal, who's, who's able to just do this spontaneously uh, and, and, uh, and, and bring you stuff the same day. Um, so that's why some of these things are just very difficult to find as a result of the 800. Next slide, please. So back in 2013, uh, you know this uh, well, um, where we had uh, the NECC, the New England Compounding Center, who we now know had uh, pretty, pretty sad conditions. And as a result of that, um, their contaminated injectables killed, I think, in the neighborhood of 70 to 75 people. Thousands uh, ir irreparably still suffering as a result of some of the damage particularly uh, methylprednisolone, which in some cases was uh, given intrathecally. Uh, things uh, we now know were, were made in poor conditions uh, and, uh, and with poor technique. So at that point, our government, uh, rightly so, decided that we needed to take a look at this process. And when the dust settled uh, in 2013, in December, there was uh, suddenly uh, the Drug Quality and Safety Act. Uh, DQSA. And uh, that then insisted that we, we have a better way to do things. And uh, they basically uh, created a distinction between a 503A, patient-specific traditional pharmacy, and a 503B, an outsourcing facility. And that's what we're going to talk about next. And if you'll advance the slide, we'll give you uh, some thoughts. So, these were actually brought into being because of the contamination issue that we saw at NECC in Massachusetts. Uh, 
this uh, just was, was massive. It's, the scale was just unprecedented in our world, uh, uh, you know, maybe a century ago, but in, in, in the most recent century, in, uh, we just didn't see this sort of thing. It, and so clearly brought to the forefront some of the stuff that was going on. And now that, uh, the, the, that the court cases are being closed and people are being sentenced and fined and, and things are, are being resolved, that issue, some of the investigation is being released and we're starting to see the slides and the pictures of what this stuff was made in. It was really an atrocity. Uh, be that as it may, um, the federal government decided that there would be 503B outsourcing facilities for all human office use components. Well, what does that got to do with us? Well, not surprisingly, where human goes, vet follows. While we haven't seen this uh, completely extrapolated to the human side, uh, each state is kind of doing their own thing. Um, and uh, many states have already adopted this and, and applied it to the vet side. So it's totally possible that your state is looking at this, most are, and, and does this have app applicability to the, the, the vet community. Next slide, please. So the distinction between a 503A, a traditional pharmacy, and a 503B, outsourcing facility, is that the 503B is essentially using quality standards applicable to big pharma. So this is a, a huge departure um, from 503A, traditional pharmacies, in that this is a massively involving the FDA, where we talked about FDA having grand oversight, but typically was shoved to the state level. In this particular arena, it's exclusively FDA and very little state level. You basically give the FDA a key to your door and they can do whatever they want to, and then uh, they do. Uh, they can have inspections whenever they want. On the FDA, sorry, on the 503A side, if you were the FDA and you wanted to inspect the facility, you often had to involve the state and um, there may have even been uh, um, applications to inspect, uh, that sort of thing. But here, it's uh, unannounced, walk in the door. I'm looking to see your stability indicating studies for this. Uh, so very, very strict FDA regulated uh, GMP standards. We have the CP, good compounding practices in the 503A side, and here GMP, uh, good manufacturing practices on the 503B or outsourcing side. A little confusing, but the result of this is that the same standards that are applied to commercially made products are applied to 503B products. That gives you a, a heightened level of assurity that the product was made uh, to GMP standards or, or a big pharmacy. Um, as a result of that, there, there is a, an opportunity then for better dating because of the exhaustive studies and uh, uh, to some extent, uh, greater prices. Next slide, please. Here's a brief show of uh, the distinction, 503A, which is the traditional pharmacy, highly customizable. If you'd like vanilla butternut in your Cisapride, by all means, get it. Uh, however, if this is a product that's made in a 503B, no, not customizable at all. You get what you get. This would be like trying to get enrofloxacin tablets from your wholesaler and saying, I'm not really crazy about the orange coating. Can I get a baby blue coating on it? No, you can. You get what you get from your wholesaler. And that's sort of what you are, are left with with uh, uh, 503B compounded products. So not customizable, uh, not terribly responsive as a result of that. If you're looking for 110 milligrams of theophylline in a mill, you can get that in a traditional pharmacy on the 503B side. 503B, uh, not so much. 503A, highly customizable. Uh, as I mentioned, the GCP, good compounding practices on the A side, uh, GMP, or uh, good manufacturing practices on the B side. So you get the idea uh, that one's more big pharma standard, the other more customizable good manufacturing or good compounding practice. As a result of this, you need not uh, issue a prescription. These don't have to be patient specific on the 503B side. In fact, they won't take a prescription for the patient. This is just like going to a wholesaler. Uh, you ask for a thousand tablets from your wholesaler. You, you can ask for 500 tablets of uh, 503B prednisolone mini melts. Um, and, and you need not have a prescription. For that. So this is uh, the higher standard for office stock, uh, better dating, um, frankly, uh, because of the way they can make them. 
you get volume discounts often. Next slide. So in terms of quality, this is just a, a, a rough appreciation of uh, the levels of quality in different types of facilities. Uh, those pharmacies that are, are um, 503A and not accredited uh, likely are not embracing all of the contemporary uh, recommendations to adhere to certain quality standards. PCAB requires a certain level of quality and, and that's an assurance that you can count on. And GMP at the 503B level offers you this uh, outrageous level of uh, quality and assurity. Next slide, please. Only two pharmacies in this country um, uh, that are uh, 503B certified. So let's start again. So out of all pharmacies in America, only 69, maybe 70 now, are 503B certified to, to do off of stock at this level of, of quality. And only two of those then uh, have any interest in the vet community at all. And, and one is Atlas Pharmacy. Next slide, please. Atlas Pharmacy is part of the family of pharmacies with uh, Covetris. And uh, while your state hasn't embraced it yet, I think you still can utilize them. It just isn't mandatory. These are the, these are the states that uh, do mandate that all of the office stock that's compounded for a vet community practice be obtained from a 503B facility. So for example, the practitioner in New York who'd, who'd like to have ap apomorphine um, is, is kind of stuck if one of those 503B facilities doesn't make it. Uh, they have to put 503B aside uh, and, and put a pet name on this and try to obtain a product from a 503K traditional pharmacy. Well, wow, that's not very responsive for apomorphine. It was really awkward there. And we're still working out some of the details across the states. But uh, this is a growing trend. I'm, I'm confident your state's looking at it. Don't know where you are in this process, but it's certainly an opportunity to engage your uh, VMA and make sure that if it's going to be done, it's done correctly. Because the other shoe that hasn't fallen in many of these states is, okay, I get that I can have 503B quality in prednisolone rapid dissolve tablets but can I redispense? Like you can redispense from a commercial product that you pick up from a wholesaler. So many states haven't gotten to that level of sophistication. Uh, the fine print here shows uh, that Connecticut, uh, the only state that has so far, feels so comfortable with the quality of a 503B product that they absolutely empower their practitioners, their veterinarians to redispense. That's a huge deal. So this is a, a great opportunity to embold your uh, VMAs to be watching for this topic, not only to ensure that it's uh, done um, correctly, but that the next part of this occurs that uh, allows you then to redispense because that's a huge deal in your world, uh, redispensing small amounts for acute situations. Next slide, please. These are the indicators. We won't go on uh, a great deal of detail here, but uh, each and every single one of these facets is heightened in the 503B arena. The facility, the environmental testing, quality testing, process validation, all of that. Uh, it's a quantum leap in, in quality above what you're used to at 503A. Now, we're not throwing 503A or traditional pharmacies under the bus because there's still a very valid, valid need for the customization that you're looking for and the responsiveness to get it there quickly. Uh, but for off the stock, uh, these, are, these are imperative. In, in, many situations for that level of quality and level of confidence and level of maturity. Next slide, please. So if there's an end to this, and, and don't you hope there is, it's that if you embrace compounding pharmacy, if you come to the light, if you follow my voice, you have options. Uh, you're no longer constrained by strengths, by dosage form, by all of the things uh, that so sometimes we, we tend to see as a robot. I, I want to start this drug and I want 17 milligrams, but it's not available commercially except in 75. Well, what do we do? Do you crush that? Do you make up your own formulation? Do we try to estimate a, a, a quarter of a tablet? Where, where do we go with that? You have options. If you want different strengths, you can get that. If you 
want different dosage forms, you can get that. If you're looking for a product that you haven't had access to in a while and thinks that it's perfectly indicated in this situation, you now have options for those sort of things. These products that are back ordered or things that are unique and, uh, uh, and, and very niche-like, you have access to these too. If you embrace compounding pharmacy, you have options. We talked back to the very beginning of the series where you had to justify the use. I hope now that you can see that there are many justifications for using compound pharmacy to get to a desired endpoint. Uh, not only is it a matter of therapeutic excellence, but it's also about just dosing compliance. How do we get this wild animal to, <laughs> to do this twice a day? How do we get this wild owner to, uh, to dose this uh, twice a day? Um, so it's as, it's as simple as enhancing the compliance all the way up to facilitating therapeutics, uh, and giving the right product to the right uh, disease state. Great opportunity, and uh, I hope now you, 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 you have a little better feel for that. And some of the shortcomings, and uh, if you're willing to endure some of those issues, the, the, the colossal advantages. Next slide. <laughs> That's a great opportunity then to address any questions that you may have. And of course, those questions that come up that deal with anything but hair care, I'm happy to help. Bruce, I'm gonna jump in. My apologies. Um, they, the PowerPoint slide deck that I gave to Heidi didn't have the last slide that included the updates. Just some of the compounding laws that just oh, yes, came up. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I know. I could tell you were looking for it. I'm so sorry. I was. I was. Oh. Um, <laughs> Great point. So Thanks for correcting me. I just kept waiting, and then uh, well, maybe we dropped it. Um, I also wanted to spend just a moment on uh, where you are in Minnesota, uh, particularly with office stock. And of course, you know that last last summer you you had some um, some things come up, and one of those was the the ability to keep office stock on hand for small uh, uh, amounts to be dispensed for acute situations. And unfortunately, your, your board embraced that, saw the need. Here's a perfect example where human doesn't always blend with vet needs. There's virtually no reason <clears throat> to, uh, that is for a human practitioner uh, to, uh, to be able to redispense a product v other than a now injection or that sort of thing. To, to get five days of, uh, of an antibacterial or an antiparasitical, there's just no need. There's a CVS on every corner. There's a Walgreens right next door to, to you. So it's easy to write a script for these things. Uh, the strengths are right, the dosage forms are right, the liquids are flavored for kids, totally. But in our world, we absolutely have a need for the uh, acute dispensing. And uh, rarely do these facilities, Walgreens and CVSs, meet all of your needs. If they do, bravo. But there is absolutely a need to be able to redispense for acute situations. We're not talking about a 30-day supply of methimazole. We're talking about three days worth of uh, 26 milligram per mil tramadol. We're talking about 60 milligrams of GABA. All, all these kind of things that are not commercially available that you absolutely have a need for. Your state uh, recognized that and now allows you to, to do that. And as a result, empowers you then to have office stock to meet those small needs of issuance. So bravo to however you all did this, whether it be through a VMA or a grassroots uh, involvement to, to convince your board, but it's absolutely essential and uh, you have that capability. So I'll just jump in and read exactly what it says and then sure. Heidi's gonna send stuff out to the attendees. So we'll make sure that that's included, but <clears throat> essentially effective July 1st of 2019, they added a new thing about compounding medications it says, compounding pharmacies can now prepare and sell certain drugs that are needed for urgent or emergency treatment of animals without first receiving a prescription. The quantity of the medication must be limited to a 10-day supply, which allows for a patient-specific prescription to be received and filled. So Bruce, do you want to just mention quickly how they could use Roadrunner and Atlas um, to fulfill that, and then we'll go right into Q&A? Sure. It's my impression that then you may have small amounts of these things to, to do that kind of dispensing. And so you need not make this uh, pet specific. You may be able to, uh, for example, have a, a, a small bottle of a, a, a common pain medication, for example, for post-op. Uh, maybe a, a, a 
typical antibacterial that you use in your practice routinely for new starts until you can get a prescription sent. So this was only for acute, only small amounts, and uh, only to cover until the, the follow-up prescription comes in if it goes beyond that period of time. I, I couldn't be more serious about being your guy in the field. If you have questions, if you uh, wonder if a product is available, if an API is even possible, uh, what options you may have for different dosage forms. My experience with talking to thousands of you uh, about uh, a particular product or course of therapy, I'm happy to be there for you. And of course, uh, call at any time.